It is week number four of Business Finance Online. Today's date is Monday, April 25th, 2022. And this is our lecture video for this week number four entitled Capital Valuation. We're looking at stocks and bonds. You have a, a couple of tasks this week and we'll uh, talk about those in just a minute. As I was saying, our task this week is chapters six and seven. Chapter six is on bonds. Chapter seven is on stocks, and that is called capital. That is how the mainly corporations fund their operations through the issuance of debt in the public markets, called a bond, and the issuance of stock in the public markets, called common or preferred stock. Chapter six and seven are shows examples and definitions of these two things. And this all leads us to our midterm examination, which covers chapters one through seven that's been posted to Blackboard in the assignments and examinations file folder. It is due Sunday, May 1st. So that's the topic of our conversation this evening. But before we get to that conversation, let's watch a short video that explains bonds and stocks. So we now know that there are two ways that a company can raise capital. It can do it by borrowing money, which is debt, or by selling shares of itself, or essentially allowing other people to become partial owners of it, and that is equity. And these directly translate into securities that you're probably familiar with, but maybe you didn't have a, a more exact idea of what they are. You know what equity securities are. And just so you know, what, what is a security? A security is essentially something that can be bought and sold that has some type of uh, claim on something or some type of economic value. So a security in the equity world is a stock, and a security in the debt world is a bond. Let me explain this. Let me just draw the balance sheet for, a, for the fictional company. It was pointed out to me that Socks.com actually is not a fictional company, that someone is indeed selling socks online. So, which I, by the way, think is a great idea. So let's see, let's see, I have my, my assets right here. These are the assets of the company, but that's not what we're worried about right now. Assets, and let me draw the equity of the company. And this is maybe shares that they sold. and. So let's say that they have, I don't know, that there are 10 million shares. 10 million shares. And then we have the debt. The debt of the company, or the liabilities. There are other liabilities other than debt, per se, but that's all we'll worry about right now. This is the debt. I'll do it in brown. We have the debt. The debt. And maybe the assets. Let me just think of a good round number. The assets are $10 million in assets. And let's say our debt is, I don't know, $6 million. And then what's left over for the equity, right? And the way you have to view it is, OK, if I have $10 million and I owe people $6 million, what's left for the owners of the company? Well, the owners of the company will have $4 million left. $4 million left. And it'll be split amongst the owners of, of the company. And there's 10 million individual shares. So if, if every, every person who has one of those stock certificates will own one ten millionth of this four million dollars, or essentially, what is it, forty cents a share or something? So anyway, this is, and I think you're familiar with this already. This is essentially stock, right? When we say ten million shares, that's ten million shares of stock. I could just draw a bunch of, I could draw ten million stock certificates, and you know, it's, I guess we'll, you know, whatever the ticker symbol is. And there could be 10 million of those. Now, debt is interesting. There's a lot of ways you can raise debt. And actually, there's a lot of ways you could raise equity. It actually doesn't have to be with selling. Well, for the most part, you are selling stock. Um, you could maybe think of some other way. And we'll talk about other forms of equity, preferred stock, and all of that. But in the simplest level, you're really always selling stock. Debt's a little different. Debt could be just in the form of a bank loan. So you know, this could be a, a bank loan. Where you literally go to the bank and say, "Hey, I need six million dollars," and they say, "Okay, here you go, and we'll give it to you for this interest." And you have to pay back the money above and beyond the interest over this time schedule, so you know, not too different than maybe a mortgage. Or they might say, "Okay, you pay the interest for five years, and at the end of the five years, you have to pay 
You also have to pay the principal amount, so you have to pay the whole six million dollars. So you maybe have to come up with a new loan or something like that. So that would just be a bank loan. There's other things that are revolving lines of credit, which is kind of like a a a company's uh, like a, I guess a company's credit card to some degree that it doesn't have to use it, but if it does, that's kind of debt the company takes on. But kind of the the one that people always talk about, I guess in the same phrase, is bonds. So bonds are essentially you. You are borrowing from the public markets again. You're borrowing from a bunch of people. So what you do is you have these six million, let's say the six million dollars, and it could be divided into, what well, we let me think of a good note. You could you could divide this into six thousand bond certificates, right? So this could be, this could be six thousand bond certificates. Let's see, in six million divided six thousand, right? That's a thousand, right? So it could be six thousand times one thousand dollar. Bond certificates, bond certificates, certificates, and let's let's visualize what a bond certificate could look like. So that could be a bond certificate, and its face value, and sometimes they'll call it the par value or the stated value. It'll say, you know, let's call it bond from company X Y Z, and it is its face value is a thousand dollars. So it's essentially this is an IOU from company XYZ. If I were to hold one of these, if I had one of these sitting on my desk right now, that tells me that company XYZ is going to pay me one thousand dollars at some future date, right? And that future date is at maturity. So it's going to pay one thousand dollars, one thousand dollars at maturity, maturity. And you say, oh well, Sal, you know that's that's all good, but what about the interest in between? And there's two ways to think about this. Maybe, maybe they're going to pay me a thousand dollars in the future, but I only have to give them five hundred dollars, right? So if you think about it, there's automatically interest accruing in that, right? If I gave them five hundred dollars, and then five years later they pay me a thousand dollars, they're essentially paying interest, right? They're paying me more back than I gave to them. And we'll in future videos we'll actually do the math of how to figure out that type of interest. And in that situation where they're not kind of paying me interest as they go, this would kind of, this would be viewed as a zero coupon bond. And I know I'm throwing out a lot of terminology, but it'll all make sense to you in a second. So zero coupon essentially means they're not paying interest until they pay off the whole loan. And then they might kind of the, the interest will be implicit in the whole value of the amount. And I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but coupon is essentially a regular payment on the bond that the company makes, in this case XYZ will make, that is essentially, you can almost view it as a kind of interest. But if you really had to figure out the interest that you're getting on the bond, you would actually have to figure out, and I'll do a whole, I'll do maybe a whole playlist on bond mathematics, you would have to figure out, you, it's based on the coupon, what you gave them, and then what they're going to pay you and when they're going to do it. So it's a little bit more complicated than just saying, oh, look at that, they're giving a, a 6% coupon, which is meant essentially means you know twice a year they're going to give me 3% of the value of my bond. So just a big picture I mean both of these things are traded. Both of you know this is a stock it's traded on exchange and you've, you're probably familiar with that if you go to Yahoo Finance you get you type in the ticker symbol and you get the price for that day. Bonds are also traded. Unfortunately, it's not as easy to get a quote on a bond. Usually you have to have a Bloomberg terminal of some type. You, it's, you can't get it on Yahoo Finance and I, I think that's by design by bond traders because they probably don't like the, the the transparency there, but it is just like just like a stock. It is a security. It is traded. There is a price, but then there's a there's a very fundamental difference in what kind of the holder of the bond is doing. In a bond, you've essentially if I have if I'm holding a one thousand dollar bond, that means that I've lent some amount of money to the company, and it'll be in this part of it. And as long as the company doesn't go bankrupt, they'll pay me some interest and pay me my money back. When I own a stock in the company, right? I own a share of the equity as opposed to a share of the debt, which was the case with the bond. When I own a share of the equity, the company's not paying promising to pay back anything. It's just saying, "Look, you are a part owner of this company, and anything that any of the owners get, you'll get." So if this company becomes worth a lot, if we start dividending out things to the shareholders, then you'll get that. If the company gets sold by someone and pays X dollars per share for it, you'll get that money. And if the company goes bankrupt, you'll also go bankrupt. And that actually leads to an interesting question. If the company goes bankrupt, and let's say, actually, let's, 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 let's do the example right now. Let's say the company goes bankrupt, right? And I'll do a more, a more, in, more in-depth example of this. 
The question is, let's say the company goes bankrupt and, it, and people decide that it's not operational anymore, that it just can't do business. Because there's actually two types of bankruptcy. There's one where you say, oh, the, co- the business is good and it just, it just can't pay off its debts, so we have to somehow restructure this side of it. And then the other type of bankruptcy is liquidation, where they say, you know what, this business doesn't even make sense to operate anymore. Let's just sell off all of the assets. So the question that I'll leave you with in this video is, what happens in a situation where you enter bankruptcy, people tend want to liquidate the assets, and let's say when you liquidate the assets, there's only $8 million of assets. So the question is, who do you think is going to eat that $2 million? Is it going to be the debt holders or the stockholders? Who is going to lose their money first? Or you can almost say, who is more senior when it comes to actually getting their money back? And I'll leave, leave you with that. Uh, maybe to the next video or a future video that I'll do on bankruptcy. See you in the next video. Okay, the answer to that question that the gentleman was referring to about bankruptcy, uh, if you have a, a loss of $2 million, if assets go from $10 million to $8 million, that $2 million comes out of equity. The equity shareholders will lose that value and that money in bankruptcy. The debt people, they get their money guaranteed by selling off the assets to cover their bonds. The stockholders, the equity holders will lose that money. That's why it's sometimes a disadvantage to own stock. Not always though, because the returns are higher and we'll talk more about that later. So here's our uh, blackboard for this current period. I wanna go over a couple of sections to make sure you're aware of. Number one, uh, examination or midterm examination is now posted. It's due Sunday night, May 1st. I have given you two files, a PDF version and a Word doc version. And remember, there's the final question of this midterm examination is to update your portfolio as of Friday, April 29th. And that will require you to post another spreadsheet. So if some of you out there are still having uh, open items on your portfolio spreadsheets, Make sure you clean those up uh, this week before you post your midterm examination spreadsheet file for your portfolio as of April 29th. Because if your April 8th index values are still incorrect, that will make this file incorrect as well. So make sure you clean up any open items in that original portfolio that you created. We'll talk about a little bit more about the midterm in a few minutes. We go to April week four this week. There's our learning assignments for the week, this lecture video, naturally. The uh, reading chapters six and seven. I gotta update that, that's not uh, spelled correctly, sorry. Uh, the review in class review problem, which we'll look at in a minute. And our graded work this week is the midterm worth 20% of your grade and it's up and running and you can begin work on it. But some of you might need to watch some of these videos and explanations in order to complete the sections on bonds and stocks in that midterm. <clears throat> but you have assignment one and assignment two as backup to the questions that are also given on the midterm. We open up week four. There's our agenda, which you saw at the beginning of class. Uh, this There's our in-class review spreadsheet, which we're going to look at in a little bit. And there's the example up to date of my current portfolio through the original portfolio. And we'll look at that in a minute to update it for this midterm week number four. Then there's some information about the NASDAQ, some PowerPoints and explanation and then further discussion and and definitions of what bonds are and what stocks are and some review questions with solutions if you wanna try uh, testing yourself with some of these questions from the textbook, but also I handle these problems also in our in-class review spreadsheet. So that's where Blackboard is this week number four. This is the halfway part of the class. If any of you wanna post any comments about halfway through our class, any, uh, if you want to schedule an individual session with me now that we're halfway through the class and want to talk about any issues or any concerns or just want to talk with me about the, the course, please uh, sign up, sign into our week number four student question uh, discussion board file and uh, set up an interview with me and let's see if our schedules mesh so we can do a Zoom session if you so desire. It's not required, 
many students like to talk with me about any issues they have halfway through the class. Also remember, we have our student hour session every Wednesday evenings from six to eight o'clock where you also can come on and talk to me about issues concerning the class. So if we go back to week number four, the in-class review, this week we're talking about capital financing, debt in the form of bonds, equity in the form of stock. Assets are funded by debt and equity, the issuing of debt, the issuing of stock. But at the same time, these assets are hopefully designing or determining profits, creating cash flow that we use to pay off this debt and stock. What are the costs of stock? The expected return that an investor wants to make off that stock, which is a combination of gains and stock price going up and dividends. Stock, remember, is determined by the market price of what the market feels your company is worth. The market sets that price. So if you buy stock at $10, the company has a good performance and the market says it it's really should be worth $15, your capital gain is five bucks. That's where you make your money in the stock market. In the bond market, the cost is interest. Where you make your money in the bond market is you get coupon payments, interest as that video explained. If I lend $1,000 to a company, they'll pay me the $1,000 back at maturity, which could be anywhere from two, five, 10 years, even 20. Where I make the money on debt is them paying me interest every year on the interest rate on the, that $1,000 bond. Debt is interest, stocks are capital gains and dividends, a key point in all that. Well, let's take a look at some of the definitions of these in our in-class review spreadsheet for this week, number four. Okay, here's the in-class review spreadsheet, which will help you further define stocks and bonds that are talked about in chapters six and seven. And as a follow-up to the video that I presented earlier, uh, the definition of bonds is again, <clears throat> to lend, be able to companies based on their credit rating and their credit history. Remember bonds are rated AAA to DDD. Uh, that's their rating system. When, if we're as individual borrowers, our rating system is your FICO score. Anywhere from 350 to, uh, 350 to 850, that's the FICO score. The higher your FICO score, the cheaper your cost of borrowing money is, credit cards, mortgages, bank loans, et cetera. The credit rating for corporations is rated by triple A, triple B, A, A minus, B, C, D. That's the rating system. There are three rating areas for corporations, Moody's, Investor Services, the S Standard & Poor, Standard & Poor's company, and Fitch. If anybody's curious, uh, the current rating for University of Laverne credit is a B plus. That's the current rating for the University of Laverne. That rating determines how much interest they have to pay when they go out and borrow money. So how does a bond work? Well, you lend your money to a company. Let's say you give them $1,000. In return, they give you two things a promise to pay back that $1,000 in whatever the maturity is. And let's say in this case, it's 10 years. That means in 10 years, you got to wait for the $1,000. <clears> At the same time, the bond also will have a coupon interest rate. That interest rate is determined by the credit rating of the company. And in this case, you can see it here, the coupon is 7%. So that means every year, this company who you lent the $1,000 to will pay 7% of $1,000 or $70 every year. Now, some bonds are issued in semi-annual interest payments. In other words, you get your interest every six months. In the case of this example, that means you would get an interest check every six months for $35, totaling $70 a year. That's the coupon. So that's where you make your money in a bond. So it's a 10 year bond. That means over the course of 10 years, you'll get $70 a year times 10 years, 
$700 of interest payments. At the same thing, at the end of those 10 years, you'll get your seven, or your $1,000 back. That's the investment in bonds. You lend them, they pay you back, you get interest. You might think 7%, uh, and I got to wait 10 years to get it. Well, it's very safe. If the company has financial trouble or declares bankruptcy or de de declares that they're in default, that they can't make your interest or principal payments on your bond, they have to immediately sell off assets to pay you. You get paid first if the company gets in a financial bind. Stockholders, on the other hand, get paid last. So if a company goes bankrupt, they settle their creditors, bank, uh, bond financing, accounts payable, taxes, employee pension plans, and the like. And then who gets paid last? The stockholders. Usually in a bankruptcy, there's not enough cash left to pay shareholders. And that's what happens. That's the risk of owning stock. That's why they call uh, uh, bonds a fixed income investment. You know exactly what you're getting right from day one. You're, you know when you're going to get your money back as far as principal at maturity, and you know you're going to get interest over the life of that bond. Now, what happens during the course of 10 years <clears throat> You don't want to wait 10 years to get your thousand dollars. You know, you like getting the 70 bucks every year, but you gotta, you look, geez, I gotta wait 10 years to get this thousand. Let's say you get antsy and you wanna sell the bond. Well, let's say after two years, I wanna sell this bond back to the marketplace. Well, this is where an expression called current yield is defined. The current yield means that, that if this company wanted to issue this $1,000 bond today after two years, they would have to pay 8% to the, to the, as interest on that new issuance. That's called the current yield. It's based on maybe their credit got worse. Maybe the economy changed and money got tighter. In other words, the yield has gone up. There's an old expression in debt financing called, if interest rates go up, a bond prices or values go down. If interest rates go down in the market, current yield, bond valuations go up. That's why over the last 10 to 15 years with very cheap interest rates, bond values were very high because money was cheap. Existing debt had a higher value. Because why would you sell a 7% bond in a 4% market? Those people getting the 4% are not going to be getting what they should be getting if they had a 7% 7, 7 bond. That would make your bond a, a, a lot more attractive. Well, let's, I want to show you the calculation for this. And it involves present value. So let's say I was going to sell after two years this $1,000 7% bond in a market of 8% current yield. Formula, function, financial. We've seen these before last week. Present value. And you practice some of this in quiz number two. So the current yield in the market is 8%. That's the current yield. The number of periods remain, well, there's two years of the 10-year bond have gone by, so that means eight years remain. The payment on this bond is $70. That's the payment, that's the coupon you're getting on this bond every year, $70. Notice I put negative 70. The future value of this bond is $1,000. In other words, at the maturity, you get back your $1,000. So what is a 7% bond due in eight years value today in an 8% current yield situation? $942.53. Interest rates have gone up in the market. This bond value has gone down. The simple example of 
cheap money and more expensive money. Why, would you sell that bond today? Well, if I really want the money, I'm only going to get $942.53. I'm going to have to take a loss. But if I want the cash, that's how much cash I would get in an 8% current yield at this point in time after two years. Another, that's the present value of the $1,000 today after two years. So somebody who wants to buy this bond from you is, is going to pay $942.53 to get a $1,000 bond at 70 bucks, so at 7%. So for the next eight years, they'll get $70 a year. Now they could go out today and pay $1,000 and get 8%, $80. But if they want to purchase this bond and lock in the 7%, they get it at a discount below par value. A key concept as far as time value of money in bond calculations. Well, let's use another example. Let's say the current yield of this 7% bond after two years is 6%. It's gone down. Formula, function, financial, present value, PV. Now the yield in the market is 6%. Number of periods remain is eight. The payment is still $70. And the future value is still $1,000. What is this 7% bond in a yield market of 6% with eight years to go worth? $1,062.10. Interest rates have gone down, bond prices have gone up. Okay, that's how that works. So when somebody says you're buying a bond at a premium, you're paying more than $1,000. Why? I'm willing to pay $1,062.10 to get 7% money in a 6% mark. And vice versa the other way at a discount. I'm willing to pay $942.53, a discount below $1,000 par, to get 7% money where I could be getting 8% in the current market. That's how it works. The best thing about bonds is, is you know exactly what you have. Even after two years, you just go and look up the current yield, have a broker get that information for you, and you know what that bond is going to be paying disturbed uh, at yielding at a discount or a premium with the current yields determining that price in relationship to the original bond coupon. That's how it all works. Bonds is debt. You're lending money, getting paid. Chapter seven is about stocks. There, you have no clue what you're going to get paid. It's a crapshoot. You have no idea how much Apple stock is going to go up in the next year or two. You have no idea what their dividend will be, if any. Now, sometimes you can go by past quarters, past years to see dividend trends, but it doesn't guarantee you a dividend. The only equity holding that gives you a guaranteed dividend amount is called preferred stock. Preferred stock means you buy the stock for the dividend. You know exactly what your dividend is going to be every quarter, every year of that stock. That's called a preferred stock. Why? Because you're locking in a dividend automatically throughout the life that you hold that stock. Now, many companies don't issue preferred stocks for a variety of reasons. Number one, they're locked into cash flow. They're now obligated to pay you a dividend every quarter and every year based on that preferred stock. It locks them into cash flow and a lot of companies don't like that. Secondly, preferred stock does not change in value. Many people buy preferred stock and hang on to it. There's not much buying or selling or capital gains or stock price 
increase or decrease in preferred stock. You buy it for the dividend. It's kind of almost like a bond. You're paying a price and getting dividends guaranteed. The price is not going to vary because most people hang on to preferred stock. It's like a fixed income investment. Most of us, and this is the stock that you're trading in your portfolio, is common stock, where you get, hopefully, the company will pay you a dividend over time. We hope, we expect that dividend. That's the difference between stocks and bonds. Stocks, you're an owner, equity. Bonds, you're a creditor, debt. Two different ways of investing in capital, two different ways that a company or a corporation can go out and acquire investors and give them the return, interest and stock price and dividends in return for that investment. We lead into our next chapters next week in eight and nine about finding assets that can pay these interest and dividends and stock growth. That's chapters eight and nine. Many times you hear about a stock and its current dividend yield. Well, that's the dividend that the company is currently paying on that stock divided by the current stock price. So if this company paid in the last year a $4 dividend, its stock price today is at $20, then their, <coughs> their dividend yield is 20%, four divided by 20. The combination of dividend yield and capital gain means that that means how much you're going to get over and above as your return on investment. If I get a $4 dividend and the stock goes up $2 in price to $22, that means I'm going to have a $22, excuse me, a $6 capital gain or a $6 investment return. $4 dividend, $2 capital gain, if the stock price is $20, $6 divided by 20 that gives me a total return of 30%. That's what we mean by total return. How much we're getting as a return on our investment. It's a combination in stocks of dividend and yield. For example, I bought Coca-Cola Company. True story. I bought Coca-Cola Company in January. Today, April 25th, Coca-Cola closed, and through the first three months of my investment, I have made 32% capital gain. Not a bad investment in a few months. Coca-Cola, you guys keep buying it. Coke Zero. Armor All is owned by Coca-Cola. Gatorade is owned by Coca-Cola. So 30%, uh, 25, 30% on a Coca-Cola is pretty good. That's a combination of dividends that Coca-Cola has paid me, plus the stock price growth over that time. As an investor, the goal is how these investment stocks and bonds fit into your risk, your portfolio. We'll talk more about that in my Friday update video. But that's the definition of bonds and stocks. And that's what you need to know about bonds and stocks for this week, number four. So this week you have a midterm examination, which is called an examination because number one, it's worth 20% of your course grade instead of assignments, which are worth 10% of your course grade. So it's, it kind of sums up the first four weeks of our course, Business 330 Finance. And it's mainly multiple choice, where I ask you to define and determine certain things from our first seven chapters. This is where the assignments that you've already done can help you. And this is where the work that we've talked about tonight can help you for chapters six and seven. So multiple choice, as you can see, nine multiple choice questions summarizing our first four weeks, and then your student portfolio. You need to update it as of Friday, April 29th. You need to find new valuations of your stock. You need to find new valuations for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. 
You also need, which will be part of our discussions beginning next week, you also need to find the beta value of your company. And you can find that very easily in Yahoo Finance. It's right on the front page of the stock summary of the company summary that gives you the beta. That's a determination of risk in the company. It's a standard deviation statistical analysis. We'll talk about this in our Friday video and also next week, beta. It's a key determinant of company performance. <clears throat> so if I were to bring up my portfolio as it stands at the beginning of our class, let me do that now. So here's my portfolio after April 8th. You, many of you have done this. Some of you still have to fine tune it, all right? But this is in our in-class review file folder for this week. So now what I want you to do is create a new section for April 29th. But you got to remember, these share prices have to stay the same. What you're doing on Friday, April 9th is determining the new stock price and then multiplying that new stock price on Friday, April 29th, times the original number of shares you bought to get your new valuation. So if I were to do this, what I would do is I would go to my spreadsheet and copy. Notice how I'm highlighting this and I'm gonna copy this, Control C. Oops, hit the wrong button. Let's try that again. I'm gonna copy this section here, hit Control C. And then I just bring my cursor down to this line and hit Control V on my keypad. And now it's copied it down. But one of the bad things that I just did that I got to be fixed is it's copied this, these cells, the formulas of these cells, like I had them here. So first of all, what I need to do is because this is not going to change. This, the price is going to change on April 29th. So make sure I do that. I change my date for Friday. Copy that down. There we go. And now what I need to do is I have to need, I have to copy these numbers, not the formulas here. So here I go back up to my original spreadsheet, hit control C or copy and come down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste values. I'm just going to paste the values here. Hit that. And now notice the formulas are gone and the original numbers are there. So then on April 29th, what I'll do is let's say the Apple price goes to $172. I don't know what it'll actually be, but I'm doing that. Let's say Ford goes to $15 on Friday. Let's say GE goes to $88 on Friday. We'll keep this basic. And Disney goes to $132. So now to determine my new portfolio value, I will go to my dollar column and type in the formula equals the price times, it's a little star, the shares, the original shares that I bought and I get my new valuation. And I just do that for all the remaining cells by grabbing that right corner and scrolling down. And now it's copied all of that down here. Let's make sure I'm, I'm nice and neat. So I put back in the equal border. There we go. And now notice what has happened from April 8th to April 29th. Uh-oh, I lost about almost $300. I went from 100,000 and with my change in price in those few weeks times my original share buys, I've lost money. And then yeah, I want all I want you to do is update this, the Dow valuations as of April 29th here. And let's see how these have gone up or down compared to how my portfolio has gone up and down. All right, so that's the question in the spreadsheet you'll be answering from that question number two in your midterm is, okay, how has your portfolio changed over the first 
couple of few weeks, four weeks of our course. And that's what you're answering. So I don't, I need to see two in your portfolio now, your original and then the adjusted one that we just went through here. Make sure your original vet indexes are correct, get the update and we're off and running. So that's what I want you to do for your midterm part or portfolio part of your midterm. And then the second part of the problem is to record in, in this examination, you don't have to report it on your spreadsheet, the beta for each one of your companies. And that's gonna lead into our discussions next week. Then the final question of your midterm, multiple choice, portfolio, and now an essay. Discuss the potential impact of the recent financial crisis pandemic of 2021 on the capital structure of your portfolio companies. How has your selected corporation changed from January 1 to December 31st? Remember, in assignment number one, you did some work on picking one company to answer those questions about earnings per share and current ratio and the like. Those answers are posted, solutions are posted in your Blackboard. I want you to take that one company. You don't have to do it for all your portfolio. Take one, the one company that you did in, quest, in assignment one and tell me how their capital structure has changed from January 1 to December 31st, 2021 in those two years. So you might wanna go on a quarterly basis. Our capital structure on March 31st, 2020 was 70% debt, 30% equity. That changed in the next quarter, or you might want to do it by every six months, however you want to do it. I want you to show me how the capital structure has changed over that time. Please cite examples from your of financial statements, corporate governance, competitive markets. How has the company changed in these two years? Have they brought in new owners and new managers? That's corporate governance. Has their markets or their industries changed over the pandemic, which has altered their capital structure? Remember, capital structure is the percent of debt and percent of equity to the assets of the company, and it must total 100%. Your essay should be a minimum of two pages and not to exceed 10 pages double-spaced. So I want you to do a little financial analysis about the capital structure over that time span, how you divvy up, you determine, but make sure you make do enough analysis to properly show the changes in the capital structure over that time period. And then tell me why you think that happened. Markets, change in management, economic issues, whatever and explain that to me in a minimum of two pages. That's your essay question for the midterm of this course at week four. So again, we have our midterm examination work, files have been posted, answer the multiple choice, fill out and update your portfolio spreadsheet about how we discussed it. And at the same time, answer an essay doing a little research and interpretation of capital structure of the specific company that you selected in assignment number one. That is your midterm examination due next Sunday. Again, we have some students who are still working on assignment two as we speak. Now you have another layer of work to do this week and get up to speed to do that work. Again, if you need extra time next week to post your midterm, if you get my approval via email, I'll be happy to allow that. But don't get into that habit of giving, getting overburdened by week after week. Fortunately, after this week, we take a week off from graded work. No more graded work until week number six. That's assignment number three. So 
make sure you take your time. You have time. If you need an extension, let me know. If you don't need extension, everything is due Sunday evening. I will post assignment number two, work, solutions, and grades tomorrow, Tuesday, April 26th. You have week four with the information and details that we've talked about. Here's your learning assignments. Here's our in-class review spreadsheet. There's a sample of my portfolio and the definitions and details of stocks and bonds. So that's our lecture video for this week, week number four. I will see some of you maybe Wednesday. We are back on our student hour section. We didn't have it, have it last week, but I will be available this Wednesday, April 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. via Zoom. The link is in Blackboard. And I will be posting on Friday a update video this week. We didn't have one last week. I was traveling and things were a little rough, but now we will have an update video further going over the definitions of stocks and bonds. Well, thanks everybody. This is Professor Hassey signing off for this week number four, and I'll see you later on this week. Adios.